This of course is not where the story begins. In a way it started 10 years ago in a very different part of the world. In 2013, after nine years of serving in a parish in Liechtenstein, there was the opportunity for a young priest to take my place and for me to take a sabbatical prior to a future assignment. Ever since my first long walk from Austria to Spain as a theology student, I'd hoped that I would get the chance to walk in the other direction, to Jerusalem. And there, in the east, I experienced the desert for the first time and something that is hard to come by in our often frantic world, silence. Of course, we all know silence, but I mean silence. I will never forget waking up in the desert at 2 a.m. because it was so quiet. Laying there and the sky exploded into a billion lights. It seemed not just a mere absence of noise, an emptiness, but something tangible, filled with a presence, infinite yet personal. This experience never left me. 
Many would say I was lucky with the position I took after having walked for 459 days and almost 9,000 miles. I was assigned to a place in the Vienna woods. There, founded in the year 1133, a Cistercian monastery is cradled by the last foothills of the Alps. It is a beautiful place, famous for its Gregorian chant and the number of monks growing every year. But my assignment there as vice-rector of the interdiocesan seminary was never a great fit. A position of leadership requires many qualities I do not possess. You need to be a good judge of character for one, which I am not. I had voiced my concerns before I took the position and yet in obedience had to promise I would at least give it a try. God, after all, does not withhold his grace, it is said. But as grace builds on nature, and the place in the valley never really became home, when new opportunities presented themselves, I asked my bishop if I could return to more creative endeavors and maybe find a quiet place to work on these. He gave permission. We are lucky that our tiny diocese, as of now, has no shortage of priests. I was asked to stay on for one more year in hiding Kreuz, and I did. But while I sat behind the ancient walls, the search had begun for a suitable place. I ended up in the Western Alps, north of the Re di Pietra, Monviso, the majestic king of stone. Huts were cheaper to buy here than they would have been to rent in Austria for the three-year period I was initially granted. And here I am still, eight years later, whenever I can be. It's been a warm winter so far. I'm not complaining. My life as a priest here in the Hermitage revolves around two things, prayer and work. Most of the latter in the winter requires me to sit in front of the computer, developing projects, writing scripts, preparing lectures for block courses I teach in Austria. But following the monastic spirit, I try to get in at least a few hours of physical labor in a day. It's good to work with your hands. It keeps you grounded. And it is certainly much nicer with the sun on your back. When I first started working on this terrace above the house, I meant to flatten it for a water reservoir. But the rock was so easy to break apart that I found myself mining it for other terraces in the garden. So my next plan was to expand the hole and build a wallapini, a partially underground greenhouse. Plans change. And they will change again, but more on that later.
My little hermitage is a cozy place. Austrians have a word for it, Gemütlichkeit. In 2015, when I bought it, however, it wasn't gemütlich. I mean, there was wine on the table to greet me. There were some water issues. But on the whole, Tony and Elena, the previous owners that had first rescued the ruin in the 80s, took everything I didn't need and left me a cute little cabin with water and electricity. And they even threw in a poster their son had fixed to the chimney some three decades earlier, a football or maybe handball player with an impressive mullet. I've actually kept it and framed it to honor those memories. Early the next year, I hung out the flag of the Principality of Liechtenstein and called for aid, and a sizable portion of the population of the tiny country answered. A bunch of former altar boys and one of their fathers came to the rescue. What is more, half of them were actual building professionals, though I could give them little to work with. Local builders also had to be hired to break through the wall. Italy nowadays has stringent earthquake laws, requiring steel frames in this region for new openings. And there was some chiseling, fitting, growing, smoothing, and much more. But at the center of the new living space, was doubtlessly the stove.
He had cut his ties to earth. He was gone. Eventually, the weather changed and winter did make a late entrance. It was a light dusting at first, but more was to come. My neighbor Martin, who is restoring a cabin on the other side of the ridge, was gone for a few weeks. I occasionally checked on his temporary housing, but this time even an early rise could not save his tent. It was not that much snow eight inches, but it was wet. Thankfully, I'd learned from Garrison Keillers, a Prairie Home Companion, and his ads on behalf of the American Duct Tape Council, that duct tape fixes everything, or almost everything.
Non esiste un terreno piano. Credo che tu sai che in un terreno piano... Ci sono vari modi, ma 
ancora qualcosa a spingere, noi non vorremmo mandare nessun rigoletto d'acqua dal nostro campo nella sala di studio. Non si chiede poi l'acqua, no? Perché se le chiede poi le rigoletto di processo, quindi diventa tutto di piano, tu si può passare sopra non è che inciampi. Però la il filtro fare te, quindi pietre grossolane, non sassi, eh, non sassi. All of humanity's problems stem from man's inability 
to sit quietly in a room alone. This loose quote from Blaise Pascal, the 17th century thinker, physicist and brilliant mathematician, pops up on social media walls occasionally. It comes from his pensées, fragmentary thoughts pent down without ever being arranged into the intended larger work. What Pascal meant was that we seek distractions. Distractions which we find necessary because otherwise the gravity of our situation, the natural poverty of our feeble and mortal condition, he calls it, would oppress us too greatly. And thus we flee into the noise and drown out the unpleasant side of reality. Pascal does not write this with scorn. I'm sure he was understanding. He must have been. His relatively short life was shaped by the Thirty Years' War, one of the longest and most destructive conflicts on the continent. Distraction was a way to cope. So what does he think the problem is? The first surely is that through the constant pursuit of distractions, we are in danger of not knowing ourselves, living life superficially, avoiding the deeper reality, the deeper questions. And all the worse it gets, so Pascal, if we mistake the distractions for sources of true happiness. We imagine, he says, the possession of the objects of our quests would really make us happy. Yet we eventually attain what we seek and soon find that we are still unhappy. The bigger house did not change our internal state. The promotion did not produce lasting contentment. A relationship that promised joy also comes with demands. We want to be at rest and are ever restless. There's something insatiable in our pursuit. There's something insatiable in the nature of our desire. Some see in this nothing but a drive, an evolutionary force that once propelled us forward, whatever forward is supposed to mean in a blind, meaningless cosmos. It holds, now that our minds perceive it, only empty promises and despair. Distractions to the rescue. Others would say with Pascal that we seek rest as by a secret instinct, a remnant of the greatness of our original nature which teaches that happiness in reality consists only in rest and not in stir. Augustine, a millennium earlier, had famously written, Restless is our heart until it rests in you, O Lord. Whereas Pascal said elsewhere, What does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in man a true happiness, of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are, though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God himself. Here it is the famous God-shaped hole in man. That is why, so Pascal, we have difficulty sitting quietly in a room by ourselves. But from what has been said, it is clear that the point is not that we have to learn to sit quietly. The point is that we should perceive distractions as distractions and not let them overpower the more pertinent questions questions we will have to face if happiness and rest are not the ultimate illusion. So we are not confined to a room. We do not have to lock ourselves in. In fact, I personally have always found walking to be perfectly ordered to this pursuit. I find pilgrimages a great way to leave distractions and the noise behind. There are stages of such a journey. The first is usually physical, pain and strain as the body adjusts. But over time the physical aspect fades into the background. 
next the mind begins to wander, thirsting for the many new impressions, encounters and discoveries. You may spend weeks sorting in your mind experiences and dialogues of the past. But eventually the rhythm of your steps will slowly clear the mind. You find yourself getting more and more quiet. And at some point, you'll stop even talking to yourself and start listening. You'll find yourself being, being as you are. Once you've become quiet, once you simply are, your hiking boots no longer matter, you have started on a journey inward. What will you find? Or whom?